So let's get started. I'll try to be quick. Uh, welcome everybody to KW Lug for November, uh, the dark lugs. Uh, thank you for making your way out of your houses when the sun is disappearing. Uh, so uh, we have two excellent presenters tonight. Uh, Paul is going to give us a Git tutorial, and Hubert is going to review Matrix. Uh, Git is a revision control system that is brutally complicated sometimes, but very awesome and taken over the world. And Matrix is a instant messaging system, encrypted and federated, and we hope it will take over the world. Other announcements I have. Uh, Stephen Paul Weaver is uh, attempting to uh, organize a, I think it was called Weaver Planet Satellite. So this runs, I think, at the same time as the Libre Conference, which is in March. It's not Boston. Boston was Boston. 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 Yeah. Libre Planet Conference is in Boston. Uh, so he's waiting for, I think he says he's waiting for exact dates and information from the Libre Planet organizers. Uh, he has a mailing list you can sign up for. The link was in uh, the KW Life mailing list. Uh, we'll, I can repost that if anyone's interested. Um, but he's looking for interest, and I assume we'll be looking for volunteers at some point in the future once he has some dates. There is a new mapping project. Uh, mapping WR. Uh, I think I posted it. Paul posted the link to the newsletter. It is primarily focused on uh, biking and low carbon uh, road planning kind of stuff. Uh, but in the process, we'll be updating uh, open street maps. So if you have any interest in mapping the city around you, um, or if you're already doing it, uh, this will be another group of people to get together with the map things. Uh, map things all together. Python. If you care. If you care. Because everybody yeah. loves Python. I, I do moon Ruby mostly, so it is I'm Ooh. glad that it's happening. Well, <laughs> it's true. I'm glad that Python is happening. Python is happening, but it's not for me. If it is for you, I think it is it's either this weekend or next week. It's like the 10th or the eleventh or something like that. I don't know if tickets are still available, but it's in Toronto. Easy to get to. You'll probably enjoy yourself. Your Python weirdo. Uh, presentations coming up here. In next month in December, we have System D and Image Processing. Nathan will be giving the System D talk, and Chris will be giving the uh, Image Processing talk. I don't know Chris, so I don't think he's here because he hasn't raised his hand. Uh, and then in January, uh, Stephen of Greenbrook Planet Fame uh, will also be giving us a talk on Dawn. Uh, it's a project that he contributes to that he is a better than YAML um, markup plane, which is a big place in the uh, So after that, we are looking for presenters. So, oh, we're also looking for a, a beginning level presentation for uh, January. So, anything you'd like to present? <coughs> Uh, so as most of you probably know, our format has been, we'll do a beginner level presentation and then like a more senior in-depth, more background knowledge kind of presentation in the second half. Um, any topics that are vaguely related to open source and free software, uh, describing a project you just used that was interesting, a project you contribute to, uh, an issue you have problems with, a thing you tried to do with free software. The examples of the last few months we had, oh, well, Sandeep did sync Sandeep, thing. thank you. Did sync thing, sync thing, and he did home oh. networking. So that was kind of like um, problems that he was trying to solve for himself, except we just had an open source solution. He came and showed what he did, walked through the problems he had, walked through the solutions that he came up with, told us what things he'll do next. So. Uh, Anything like that, if you have something you'd like to present, uh, drop it on the mailing list or let one of us know. I was so fast at this. Who has something Sorry. they'd like to present? <laughs> Does anybody have anything they'd be interested in presenting, either for beginners or a more technical presentation? Okay, part two. What things would people like to learn? That doesn't mean you're obligated to present about those things. William. So 
certificates and certificate authorities? Yeah, and SSL. And SSL. So is there anybody in the room who would like to present about certificate authorities and SSL? Is John raising his hand? Kind of. I've never heard a presentation, but I do find DKI really interesting, and I might be able to. Great. Uh, something. So. Great. So I don't. So conditional. Yes. Yeah, you might be better then. No. 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 But, no, 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 no my talk is is it will make your uh, your beanie on your hat just fly <laughs> off. <laughs> Are you interested in doing it at a beginner type level, or is this more? It sounds like maybe it's a more technical type talk. I can give a beginner intro and, and kind of use trust point as Good. a, yeah, I, I can try to do something. Great. Um, when do you need for January or? Uh, five minutes, five minutes plus. Yeah. Uh, anything above uh, SSH. I, have, I understand SSH and uh, generate and anything. anything something above, more sophisticated yeah, than. More than that, that's an SSH. But you're, you're interested in X509 certs, like, what, like web certs? Um, since I don't know what you're talking about. Yes. <laughs> 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 X509. Okay. Good. You, you can give it as early as January, or we can yeah. put you at any month that is convenient for you. Okay. I think just talking about, like, there are probably enough to talk about certificate chains as a beginner level. Sure. Everyone should know. Okay. So. Okay. Anything else that anybody would like to know about? Nobody wants to know about anything. That's why we go to user group meetings. Everything. Everything. I don't know what I don't know. You don't know what you don't know. Um, Tim. I don't know if I can actually stretch this out an hour. I've been playing around with USB over IP. USB over IP. I like it. Yes, when you want some really crappy performance, and <laughs> you can get my phone. Can you can you give us forty minutes or half an hour? That's all we need. Um, USB. Um, the other half being IP over USB. That's also a thing. Yes. Um, Okay. You want to go February? Uh, let's go with. I, I, let's push me to January. It's a small topic, so I'll be able to talk together. We have an advanced level talk for January. Oh. Um, okay, February. February? Okay. And then John, you can be in January. As an introduction. Yep. So mm -hmm. okay. Anything else that people would either like to present or like to learn? I think I was thinking presentations I'd like to see. Uh, things like Inkscape or GIMP or Audacity or. Like multimedia type things? Yeah, multimedia type things. What day? Sorry, what day would be January? It's first Monday? The first non holiday Monday. The sixth? Maybe. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Cool. Probably yeah, would guess yeah, January sixth on Audacity. Okay. Yeah? Great. Do you have a sense of when? Um, January. No, nope. we've got January covered. We can use February or later. February. Okay. Great. Anything else you'd like to offer or see? Because if you say just please put it on the mailing yeah, list, then you know how many you get. <laughs> right? Not not enough to fill up the year. If you look them in the eye, then it works. Um, the last thing is the if anybody knows people who do Ruby and are interested in doing either presentations or helping to contribute to Ruby projects, uh, I'm doing the schedule for KW Ruby for 2020 in the next like, month or two. Fingers for my goal is to have six presentations for the year. Um, and then we'll do six workshops for the non-presentation nights. Um, the intention for the workshop will be like actually like, doing pull requests on projects people do. So if you know anybody who does Ruby stuff and they have something they want to present, I would love to do it. Um, that's it. Well, for sure.
record. Well, maybe I can go push record. I'm gonna turn off the lights and push record. All right, everybody, I'm gonna go turn off the lights and push record. Uh, oh, um, if you have a uh, question, we're gonna make an effort to pass the microphone around. If you need water or the bathroom, it's down that way. And after the presentation, a bunch of us will usually go out for dinner. I think if the rotation is the normal rotation, we will be going to the Dumuri House, which is like five steps out of it. Now Paul is going to go press the record button. I gave too much information. Hi, everybody. I'm Paul. Most of you know me. If I'm too quiet, that's usually, I'm usually not too quiet. Sometimes I'm too loud and shouty. So if I'm starting to get shouty at you, then say, don't be so shouty. It's only a presentation, you don't have to be so angry. Um, this is my beginner's level Git presentation. And it really is beginner's level on account of I'm kind of a beginner. So if you use Git on a regular basis, you may very well know all of this stuff. Let's start with a motivating conversation. A motivating conversation. Can we see at the bottom? Okay. So this motivating conversation was with a person whose identity I will uh, keep private, so I'll just use a pseudonym. Let's call him Andrew. <laughs> and I said, hey, Andrew, can you please add these links to your amazing project, wr-board.ca? And then Andrew goes, what? Add them yourself. And so then I go, Sudo, hey Andrew, add these links to wr-board.ca. <laughs> and then Andrew goes, Paul is not in the sudo list. This incident will be recorded. <laughs> so that didn't work out so well. So then what do I do? So then I say, how do I get these links added to wr-board.ca? Question mark, question mark. And then Andrew says, do a merge request, which is just like a pull request on GitHub except on GitLab. And then I say, oh. And then I say more things, okay, I guess, I'll learn how to make a merge request. And then I say the fatal thing that I always say that always, always, always gets me in trouble. If you've seen me present before, we can say this in unison, how hard could it be? Okay, so let's see how hard it could be. So, let's start by talking about version control. What is version control and why do we even want to use it? So, um, how many people have used version control? I think most people. How many people have never used version control? Not too many people. Oh, great, great. So we are talking for one person and also maybe some others who are too ashamed to raise their hand. Um, why, what is version control? So here's the basic idea. You got a bunch of files or you got a project. Doesn't have to be source code for like programming. It could be lots of different things, but text formats make more sense than non-text formats. And the idea is you keep track of changes. And so you're, you make some changes, you keep track of it, so you can kind of go back in time if you want. The other thing that modern version control do, does is it keeps track of changes other people make to your files. So I'm collaborating with John here, I'm making some changes, but now John wants to contribute to my project in some way, so he makes some changes, and version control is supposed to make it easy for me to incorporate his changes. The third thing that I thought of was like branching your files into alternative universes. So you try out something that's really scary, but you don't want to mess up the stuff you have now. And so if you want to do that, well, it's helpful to be able to make an alternative universe and step into that time hole, try that thing. If it works, that's great. You can bring it back into your own universe. If it doesn't work, then you just throw it away and you pretend you never did it. Except that it's inversion control, so it's remembered forever. So version control is usually with software. There's many different kinds of version control systems. And if I was giving this talk like 10 years ago, I'd be like, there's a big fight between version control systems. But it turns out that get one, so that's basically all I'm gonna be talking about. <laughs> Why would you even do this? Well, one, I thought of some reasons. You may have some more. Um, you can go back and you can find the place where you introduce bugs. So I write some code and it's amazing code and later somebody finds that there's a bug in it. Where did I introduce that change? Version controls allows you to answer that question. Um, the allowing other people to make changes to your stuff allows different people to work on the same sets of files, which is helpful if you're developing software or doing any kind of collaborative project. We used it in a non-programming context when we were doing um, our municipal voting website because then we had CSV files that we were using version control for. 
Reduce worries about killing your babies. Not literally killing your babies, but you wrote some code and you spent all this time on it and now you don't want to get rid of it even though you really should. So then you make like a backup copy, like my code version one, my code version two. Instead of doing that, you can just commit your babies and then get rid of them. And then if you need them in some point in the future, you can go back and get them. If you make stupid ideas, you can roll them back, which is a thing I do quite a lot. And if you have met multiple releases of your software, you don't have to copy the entire code base and then try and maintain two things in parallel. You can have kind of one copy of your code base and many different releases on it. And if you make a bug fix that applies to many different places, at least with Git, it's feasible, if not super easy, to then apply that change to many different releases of your code. Those are some of the reasons. Did I miss things? Should I be adding things here that are really important for version control? Okay. So, this is a presentation that's a beginner presentation. So what I am doing is I had two things in mind with this presentation. First of all, learn just enough git slash gitlab commands to make a merge request slash pull request, right? Um, Ordinarily, I would have just like given up and done this presentation with GitHub because I'm a monster and I love proprietary software. Um, but then Andrew said, no, you have to use GitLab because that's where my presentation is. So all of this stuff that I'm doing is kind of transferable. There's a few shortcuts in one or the other that um, will be helpful in, in, in one or the other, but in most cases, this knowledge is transferable. Also, I was talking with Bob and he doesn't want to use any of this stuff. He just wants to synchronize between servers. And so you can kind of take some of the stuff that I'm talking about and use it there. Also, learn enough about how Git views the world to work with it. So here's the thing about Git. As a kind of beginner, I find Git confusing in the sense that it thinks about version control and files in some very strange way that you really kind of have to understand if you're going to do more than just adding and committing. And so my goal here is to kind of show you some of the terminology, show you some of the concepts, and then hopefully get you a, a visual understanding of what's going on well enough so that they say, do this command or, you know, modify the global lot with the global lock, then you'll have some idea of at least what you should search for and how to interpret the results. So that's what I'm here to do. Caveats, I really am a big Git beginner. Um, how many people have used Git like once a week or more frequently? Okay, so these people all know more than I do about Git. Um, also, because Git is kind of complicated and intricate, you can go way deep in the weeds, and you can be like, well, no, when you take a signature of a commit, then you're not taking a signature of the files, you're taking a signature of, you know, the Git tree and stuff like that. And so I'm glossing over some details, but if I'm screwing up and saying something that's totally wrong, like I was doing in yesterday's version of this presentation, then by all means, correct me. Um, but I'm gonna try not to go too deep in the weeds. And then I'm focusing on GitLab because um, that's where I did project is. Okay, prerequisites. So I'm assuming that you're okay with using Linux and you're okay with using the command line. You don't have to be amazing and be a Vim expert or whatever but you should know how to CD into folders, you should know how to type commands, you should know how to use a text editor, I'll be using Vim because Jason showed me how to last month, and you should be comfortable using a bit of SSH. Um, I'm assuming you have a GitHub or a GitLab account, and you've got an empty project in it, so you just follow the instructions there, and also I'm assuming that you associated an SSH key with that GitHub or GitLab account, and you use SSH agent to remember that key, um, that's not too hard to do, but there's lots of guides online that are pretty straightforward to do that. Tim? Quick note, uh, we can't see anything after the O in project. We can't see anything after the O in project because yeah. that's cut off. Is it cut off yeah. on both sides? I just want to make sure you don't put anything important over there. Well, okay, this is going to suck. Um, <laughs> I think there's a line graph mode out here. Okay. Yeah, there is, but uh, <laughs> by all means, tell me about those things. I didn't realize. How's that? Yep, Better? That's okay. Yep. And so if, if there's other visibility problems, by all means, always tell me. Okay, here's the funniest joke. How do you make a bajillion dollars on the internet? How do you make a bajillion dollars on the internet? 
Well, okay, so um, the, the answer to the joke starts with, you know, you put version control, and oh no, I, don't, I ran out of time, I can't go through the joke, we'll talk to it about it later. So you do something with version control to make a bajillion dollars. Okay, demo time, oh no, I forgot to make a demo, so let's make a demo just on the fly. So, here's gonna be my demo. What I have is, I have this very talk, talk.md, so if we look at talk.md, then here's the talk that we have, and then we have some terminology, here's some crazy terminology about git. Working folder, repository, index, hash, commit, head, branch, merge, fork, bare repo, pull request, all of these things that you're supposed to know somehow when you're using git. And these are some files, and then I also have in here some pictures. What we're going to do is we are actually going to treat this as a Git repository and super live on the edge and try to make commits and show how this thing changes as we update it, okay? So what do we have so far? We have nothing so far. This is not a Git repository at all. If I try to run a command, so let's do git status, which is our favorite command, then it says fatal, not a Git repository or any of the parent repositories. Is that too low? Are we okay with that? Okay. So it's not a Git repository at all. So what does that look like? Well, that looks like this. So here's a blue kind of, it's not supposed to be a cloud, it's supposed to be like a pooly blob or something. And uh, in this pooly blob, we have our files. And Git doesn't know anything about these files, okay? Why is it not? No, okay, I'll just leave that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start making a Git repository. And the way I'm gonna start making a Git repository is I'm gonna take this plain old folder and I'm gonna say git init. So, you start out with before git, git does not know anything about your files. And then git init, what that does is git now makes a dot git folder and git adds an index. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like in code. You go git init and then if you look at your files, there's now a little git repository there. And now I can do git status and that's gonna say, look, I'm on this weird thing, branch master, it's the initial commit, and there's no files that are tracked, but here's the files that I know about. That's what Git is telling me. So if I'm looking at that conceptually, then what that looks like is something like this. Okay, so this thing, which was my folder, Git's gonna call the working folder, or the working tree. This yellow thing is gonna be conceptually this thing that I call the index. And this is the first weird thing about Git. So when you are committing files in Git, Git by default wants you to explicitly add all the files you're going to put in the version control. So right now, there's all of this stuff, but there's nothing in the index. So now let's add something to the index, right? So I'll go git add, but, uh, sure, we'll add terminology.md, and then now we'll go git status again. And then what it says is, oh look, I've got a brand new file that I'm going to add. The next commit that I'm going to make is going to be terminology.md. Yeah? Can make a bump? Yeah, can make a bump? Maybe just short. dollar sign? Uh, you, my prompt is too big? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah this is going to suck. If you just change PS1 to dollar sign space? PS1. Right, set. PS1 equals slash dollar. What's that? Nope. Okay, here's another thing I can try. Let's see here. PS, just export PS1 equal. How's that? Is that still yeah. visible? Yes. For people yeah. at the back? Okay. So let's do that because otherwise I lost, I'm going to lose my master thing and then I'm going to totally get confused when we talk about branches. So, now I've got a new file, it's terminology.md, and if I wanted to, I could commit this. But let's commit another thing. Let's also git add talk.md, and now I go git status. 
So the first command that is really important is get status because that tells you what you're at. So if I go here and now I now I'm gonna go I don't know if I'm gonna keep on writing these out. Maybe I won't. Get init, get status are the two commands that I care about at this point, and that shows me the stuff that's in my that's that the stuff that's in my index so far, those are the green ones, and these are the ones that it has not tracked in the working folder. So now, um, when I want to add files, adding files, the command to do that is git add. And you can add a single file, you can add files with a star, like a globbing pattern, you can add a folder and then it'll add all the files in that directory. Let's add one more file, git add pix uh, zero zero. So my initial thing, and now I go get status, and now I can see, oh, there's all of these files that I haven't added and some that I have, okay? So that's what Git does right now. There's no commits yet. I haven't actually remembered anything. I'm just in the stage where I'm preparing to remember something, okay? What is Git actually putting here? What Git's putting here, I think, I usually think of it as it's putting in files, but that's not quite right. What it's doing is it's putting in changes you would have to make to the current repository to get to the next state. So it's kind of putting in differences of files. So for example, so I'm starting out with no files and now I'm putting in these three files. What changes would I have to make? Well, I'd have to add a bunch of lines to these three files in order to make my repository go into the next state that I care about. So. And then if I want to look at that, I think I've made a picture for that. That looks like this. It opens, there we go. So I've added some files, oops, I forgot my picture, but whatever. This is in my index still. This is my working folder. I have no commits yet. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually commit something. How do I commit something? I go git commit. And then if you want to use a text editor, you just type that. Otherwise, you can type a little message, initial commit of talk. And then that has now created my very first commit in this thing, okay? So now, what does that look like? Well, there's a new command, so there's git status. And git status should say, oh, there's nothing more to add in the index, but there's a bunch of files you haven't committed. and if I go git log, it'll say, oh look, you made an initial commit, and this commit has this name. So what is this name? This name is a really random looking kind of intentionally identifier called the hash. And what git does is for every commit, it'll make this signature. The idea is that it's going to be unique for every commit across every repository. So if I make if I have two commits that have the same hash, what Git is assuming is that they're actually the same commit. And why does this come in handy? Because if I've got a repository and Andrew's got a repository, and I take my commit and I try to put it in Andrew's repository, that can sometimes work. And the reason it can work is because Git is really thinking about a repository as a bunch of commits, each with these individual hashes. And the idea is that they're not changeable, right? So, um, and then, so if I look at that, that now looks like, oops, that's the same one. Sorry. Sorry again. First commit. So there I go. Here's my commit. This is now the wrong uh, hash. The hash here would, in fact, be this giant thing. So let's see, can I paste the giant thing? Made my commit a little bit ugly, but there you go. And in Git, when you're specif you sometimes need to specify the commits using this weird hash. What you can do is you can abbreviate it so that the hashes are unambiguous. And usually people are like six characters is enough. Right now, one character would be enough because there's only one commit. Um, but usually people will abbreviate this giant thing and you'll say, well, I only, whoops, don't want to do that, there. You just take a prefix that's going to be unique. And that's going to be kind of my first commit, okay? 
So now what have I got? Working folder, my index, and my very first commit. The other things that it made is it made a little pointer to this commit called head, and head refers to the latest commit that I've done, and it's got a thing that's a branch, and the branch, probably not a good size, is something called master. Let's see. Let me change that just a little bit. Font size. Okay. And now this is the master branch. I don't want to outside. Okay. So that's my very first commit. And this is a block. And what it is, is it's got the hash and it's got whatever changes I needed to make. So let's make some more changes, right? So now what I can do is I can say, okay, well, I've made some changes to my talk. And I'm going to say, well, now I'm committing changes. And that's going to be git commit and then dash m and then some message. And then another thing that's, and then two more useful things that are useful to look at is git log to see what changes we've made and again get status. Sometimes it's helpful. There, there's a lot of different formats for git log that are kind of useful. Um, I'll get to those later. Okay, so here we are, git status, and it shows me I've modified this, but there's all of these untracked files. So why is this red? This is red because this is a file that git knows about, but it's got changes that, it, that it's not committed yet. So this is a file that's maybe in a dangerous space because if I just blow away my computer and just keep the repository, I may have lost some changes. So how do I fix that? Well, I can go git add talk.md again, and now I can go git status, and now my talk.md, it now knows it's got up-to-date versions of this file, right? Now, here's something that's a little bit weird that confused me. Let's say I add another line so, you know, um, if you add a file and then change it, it will show up in the index and as not modified. So there's my sentence. I go get status again. And now you can see, uh-oh, the same file is here and here. What does that even mean? Well, that means the snapshot of the version was the one when I did the git add, and now I've subsequently made some more changes to it that have not been added. So if I really want to get up to date now that I've made that change, then I can go git add, talk to me again. And now I go git status, and now we can see that I've modified and I've added my modified file, right? And similarly, if I want, I can change files. I can also add new files. So let's git add some new files. Pix01 init and Pix02 add and maybe Pix03 first commit. And now if I look at that, then I've got some more files. Git commit them. After first commit. And this is the log message. The log message is pretty important because you see it all the time. Now if I go git log, it says, oh look, I've got two commits. Here's my first one. Here's the log message. Here's my second one. It's got this ID, and here's another message. So that's what's happening there. Another thing that I can do is I can go git log, um, credit equals one line, and then that'll make it so it only shows me the signatures and, um, and, the, and the commit messages. Okay. So I can do that a bunch of times, and 90% of the time, that's all I'm doing. I'm making some change, hopefully testing it out, committing my changes. Making some change, testing them out, hopefully committing my changes. That's basically almost all of what I do. And when you do that a bunch of times, then conceptually what it looks like is something like this. Oops, okay. Oh. Whoops, or 
There we go. So what we've got here is we've again got this head, but this is always pointing at the latest commit. This is my master branch. I have, I'm adding things to the index and then committing them as I go. And now I've got a bunch of commits. Why am I drawing the commits like this? Well, Git kind of conceptualizes it. When you have a commit, it's got kind of the changes that you're making to that individual file, and it's got a signature. And what the signature is made up of, here are the changes I've made. It's got some information about who's made the changes, what their email address is and their identifier. And it also knows about the commit that came before it. So if you're familiar with the computer science concept called trees, then this is a parent and this is a child. And it turns out that in Git, all the, every child knows its parents, but it turns out that not every parent, a parent doesn't necessarily know all of its children because they could be floating around in clones someplace. That's the information. And um, if you remember last month's talk, was it last month when, when George was talking about blockchains? This is kind of like a blockchain, right? Because what you got is you got some information, you got a signature. If you change one bit of that information, then everything kind of changes. And it's kind of a chain because everything is knowing what its parent commit is. And that's the way that Git kind of thinks of the world. So the repository part for Git is actually all of this. It's the set of commits. Okay? Are we okay with that so far? Okay. So, now we can make a bunch of changes. That's all great. Now let's get a little bit crazy. Let's go to branching and merging. So, what's the idea here? So I've got these files, they're great, they're my project. Maybe I want to do something dangerous or maybe I want to do something that should not be reflected in the mainstream of this project, right? So often this will be like, I'm adding a new feature or you know I want to try out something new. So this is now where we're going to start making alternative universes. <coughs> This is where the terminology master comes in handy. Because all of this in the main line, default, by default, Git will name, this is the master branch. And the last commit of the master branch is here. What we're going to do is we're going to make a different branch, and then things are going to start forking. Uh, there, there's going to be a fork in this. So how do you do that? Well, let's look at this. Git branch dash a will show me all of the branches that exist so far. Um, this branch here only has a master branch, so that's a helpful command. And now for the purposes of this talk, let's say that I've got this terminology file, and I've got some terminology, now I want to start filling out the terminology, but I don't want to, for whatever reason, add it to my main branch right now. So what I'm going to do is I am going to make a new branch, start committing my terminology changes to that new branch, and then when I'm happy with it, I'll merge it back into the main branch. Okay? So that's where we're going there. So let's do that. So you go git branch, and then you give it a name. I'll call it term, so terminology. And now, if I go git branch dash a, we can see that there's a master branch and a terminology branch. Right now, I'm not using that terminology branch, but it exists. Now, if I want to start using that terminology branch, then I can go git checkout, and then the name of the branch. There, it says I switched to that branch, git branch dash a, and then it shows me that I'm now in the terminology branch. Great, who cares? Well, now what I can do is I can now start editing files, and I can add them to my other branch. So let's go into my terminology branch, Let's say, okay, what's the working folder? Where are you edit files? What's the repository? A collection of commits. What's an index? Where get um, stages the next things to be committed, right? So there's a few nice definitions. They're probably not perfect. Get status, and now it's gonna tell me, oh, you modified terminology.md. Well, what do I want to do? I want to add it. So I'll git add terminology.md. And now git is prepared to add this. And then I'll commit it. Start populating terminology. And there we go. And now if I go git log, then it says, oh, you still got three commits there. Great. 
That's fine. That's fantastic. You'll notice the last commit here is 000F, so that's how it begins. That's a good thing to begin with. But what happens with master? So now, if I go git checkout master, and then it says, oh, I switched to the branch master, git status, it doesn't have anything to commit. Well, I just committed stuff, that's fine. If I go git log, then you see that that commit's missing. Because that commit that I did, the 00F1, I did it in the other branch. So in the master branch, it doesn't actually know that it's there, right? Now, I can do crazy things like on both branches, try to modify terminology.md. If we actually look at terminology.md, it's still there, but you can see that it's empty in the master branch. But now if I get check out, check, check out the terminology branch, you see it's populated again, right? So, let's do one crazy thing. Um, in master, let's edit this file that's not been changed, and then let's maybe say, okay, um, um, let's add another piece of terminology. Um, I don't even know what terminology to add. Clone? Hmm? Clone? Clone, great. Clone, and maybe push. Do I push? Do I pull? There's some more terminology, right? Now, I'm in my master branch. I can go get add terminology status, git commit, and it will let me do this, add more terminology, and it's committed it, I get log, and then I can see now I have three commits, but my 00f commit is still missing, git checkout terminology, and we can see I've got, I don't see that there's any changes to terminology, that's great. If I go get log, then I've got three branches, but you can see the top commit is different. So now what I've got is I've got my main branch and now it's forked off. There's one set for changes in terminology on the terminology branch and another set that's in the master. Yeah? Uh, I, when I, when I, I use exactly the same workflow as do except for one thing. When a file is already in the repository, I don't need to get the add again. I just do a git commit on So when you do, you don't do another git add. So then I think that, I, I don't think that if you just do a git commit to a file you've made changes to, git will put it in, unless you're doing like git commit dash a. But I could be wrong about that, right? Yeah, that's right. Git that's commit right. dash commit a. Commit and then the file name. And, uh, yeah, or okay, yeah. yeah. So you can git commit then the file name. I, okay. I believe that. I don't ever do that, but I believe that, right? Yeah. So, git branch terminology. So I'm just uh, catching you up on the commands that I've done get branch terminology, get checkout terminology, and get log, I've used, and then, um, yeah, and that's, all the, and that's all the commands that we've gone through so far, okay? So, now I've got two branches, and they've both made changes to terminology, so now the universe is diverging. What am I going to do? Well, maybe I want to bring them back together, and that's what's going to be the next step. So let me open up my, uh, Close a few of these. Uh, whatever. So now my tree looks something like this, right? So I've got my main branch, my master branch here, and then I've got some terminology branch, and maybe I've made a few changes there. The last time they were in sync was this commit there, right? Now that's not actually the case how it looks like in R branch, the last commit that's in sync here is uh, 6CHC. That's the last time they were. So this would be 6CHC, and here are the commits that I've subsequently made it in master, and here are the things that I've subsequently changed in terminology. Now I'm saying, okay, now I want to bring them back together. How do I bring them back together? The command is git merge, but you kind of have to do it in a funny way. So. I'm going to git merge, and I'm going to say, okay, where am I? I'm in terminology. First I git checkout master, because I want to merge terminology into master. And now I go git merge, and then the branch name, terminology. And if I'm lucky, it's going to work. Now if I go git log, then what it does is it merged this terminology, and now it's, in, it's included on my master branch that other commit. 
So then that, that brought it together. And the way that it did it is it brought this together and it made a new commit that now has two parents, unlike the other way, right? So then I go here, and uh, I open it up. And now we see, and then we have this new commit here that's a merge of these two guys, and then I can keep on committing here. And I can have as many branches as I want, I'm just doing it with one for an, an easy example. If you want to see a graphical version of this, git k will kind of show you what's going on in this case here, right? So you can see it branches and then it brings back together. So that's a helpful thing for visualizing this stuff, right? So to merge, I want to git checkout master, git merge, terminology, and I'm eliding a bunch of things because usually when you're dumb like me and you git merge, there's conflicts and you have to resolve those conflicts and then merge it. Git's pretty good about telling you what to do, but it takes up too much time. And then the other thing is git k. Okay, so what am I doing? I have five minutes left and that's not enough time to get through everything. So why don't I, so this is enough to tell you about branching, it's enough to tell you about merging, and now let's actually jump ahead a little bit and let's talk about GitLab. So I was going to show you how you actually upload things to GitLab and then download and upload those things. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to step a step at, at, at the risk of being even more confusing and we're just going to show how to get stuff from Andrew's repository to me so that I can edit it. And there's kind of a bunch of steps here. So in addition to branching and pushing and committing, there's this thing called clone and push and pull. And the idea here is that what I'm going to do is Andrew has a copy of this repository or some repository on his Git lab. I am going to make a complete copy of that to my Git lab. And then I'm going to pull a copy of that down to my machine. I will make changes there, push it up to my Git lab and ask Andrew to commit it. So let's see how much of that we can do. So here I am on my Git lab. I can go to gitlab.com and can't. I hope that's Andrew's GitLab. And I can go to his amazing WR dashboard repository. Okay. So where's his amazing WR dashboard repository? There it is. And now on GitLab, what it will allow me to do is it will allow me to make a copy of his repository into mine. You would think, oh, I can just go from his to my own copy. Maybe there's a way to work with it. I never really seem to make it work. So you guys can all make it work because you're better than me. So I'm gonna fork this. First I hit fork. And then what that should do is that should put a copy of his GitLab into my GitLab. Sure, put it there. And now what I have is a copy of his entire repository. Gets interesting in that when you make a copy or when you make a checkout, then you actually have a complete version of the repository by default. So every, it, it's like gremlins, right? You put a piece of, you put some water on the gremlin and a new gremlin comes out. It's not just part of a gremlin that you get back, okay? So here we go, here's WR dashboard. So that's step one. The next thing I gotta do is I gotta clone. And what clone means is get a copy of the repository that's on my GitLab and put it on my machine. So I'm gonna do that right now. Here, I'm gonna clone with SSH, just copy this thing. I can figure out how to copy and press this thing. And now I'm gonna open up a new thing. Let's go up, git clone. And let's see if this works. There. Now it's got a copy. I've got a copy on my machine, I've got a copy on my GitLab, and I've got a copy on Andrew's GitLab. So if we open up the way that that looks, that looks something like this. So I've got a copy on my GitLab, and Andrew's got a copy on his, and I've got some working folder here. Don't worry too much about this. This was another thing that I was pointed that I didn't have time for. Now what I can do is I can make changes to mine, I can commit them, and then I can push those commits up to my GitLab. So let's do that for one example, okay? 
So CD, WR dashboard, let's make a branch, get branch, we'll call it mud dive. And now we're gonna go into his data folder and then we're gonna go into his audio and we're gonna say, oh look. Did switch branches. Oh, did I not switch branches? Get checkout mud dive, thank you Nathan. VI uh, audio. Mud Dive. Okay, here's the Mud Dive podcast. It's an amazing podcast, except that it's changed its address. It's no longer here. It's now here. Ah. Okay. Okay. Now, I've made this change. I can go get status. It says that I've made the change. I can add it. And now I can commit it. And that's all the stuff that we've known about before, right? Now what I'm going to do is I've got a new branch here. I am going to take that branch and make a copy of that branch onto my own GitLab. And the way that I do that, hopefully I've got this right, uh, git push origin so origin is the name that GitLab gives for this copy of the repository. And by default, Andrew's copy of the repository is gonna be called upstream. And then I'll say the branch, what, what died. And now what it's done is it's taken my change, it's moved it up to my Git. So now if I look at my GitLab here, it might, if I'm lucky, say that you made a new branch. There, it says you pushed a new branch up to your repository on GitLab. Now, it's giving me the option of doing a merge request. What's a merge request? Well, so far when I've committed and I've pushed and things like that, I've never asked to ask anybody any permission. But Andrew's a meanie. He doesn't want me pushing to his GitLab directly. He wants to look over things first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask permission of Andrew. Please, Andrew, can you please make this change? and then hopefully he will do it and he will not give me pseudo errors. So, how do I do it? I say create merge request. And then this is all, uh, the other thing to say is this merge request and pull request, they're not in Git itself, they're in GitLab or GitHub. The, the Git itself does not, as far as I know, have an ability to ask for these permission changes, right? And then I give uh, Andrew Yo dog, the URL has changed. Very helpful thing. And then it should say someplace, there is the commit that I want Andrew to accept. Now I go submit merge request. And then if I'm lucky, what should happen is now on Andrew's copy of the project, it should now say, oh look, here is a merge request from me, it's merge request number five, and Andrew can see this, and then Andrew can say, okay, I can merge this or I cannot. And Andrew didn't give me permission to merge things, so that's fine, it's up to him now. So I've asked him permission to put in that merge. And usually you're supposed to do smart things like actually check whether it worked and whether the URL is correct, but we live on the edge here. So what that looks like in, in my final sort of uh, picture here, looks something like this. So I've got my copy of WR Dashboard. I've got the copy I've got on GitLab. And if I want to go back and forth on this, then I can, if I want to push things up, I use git push. If I want to pull things down, I use git fetch and or git pull. And I can make as many changes as I want and I don't have to ask permission because I own both of these things. Now, when I wanted to get a copy of Andrew's repository in the first place, I used fork on GitLab. And when I want to Andrew to take some changes, I make a merge request or a pull request and that goes there. This last thing is a, another little arrow because what I can do, this is a funny thing about git, I'm not I'm not limited to only pulling and pushing changes here. 
I can't push changes to Andrew's other repository, but I can pull changes from his repository directly. And the reason that comes in handy is because Andrew's been very busy this entire presentation making changes to his repository. My copy might have gone out of date. So then what I have to do is, the only workflow I found is, go to Andrew's copy of the repository, get his changes into my local one, push those changes back up to mine, and now these two are in sync. So maybe there's other ways to do it, but that's kind of the workflow I found. Git is very agnostic about workflows. You can do whatever kind of workflow you can as long as you can access the other repositories. Okay? And that is um, how you make, or that's how I have learned how to make pull requests on wr-port.ca. And we are out of time and I didn't get the book. So I'll update these notes and I'll put them up. Um, are there any last minute questions in the last two minutes before we break? Okay, did anybody learn anything? Yeah, two people, not too many. Okay, so it was a very beginner presentation. I hope that it was okay. Um, and thank you. If you have any questions, I'll take questions. Otherwise, maybe we should break and then give Hubert a chance to start off. Question. Not uh, a tough one. Something that might be helpful is uh, showing what's changed between a couple commits. What has changed between commits? That is an excellent thing to look at. Do you remember what that is? It's uh, git, git dip, look. And then I use git log dash p is what I usually use, oh. and it will show me the and it will show me the the changes that were made in each commit. There's another command I can't remember exactly. It might be git show. log dash dash name only, and all that will do is that'll show me the files that have changed in my git log, and that's helpful too if I don't want to see the entire changes. But then yes, there's also git dip, which is helpful um, when you're when you're looking for changes. You can also do git show and a commit ID, or it'll do the last commit by default. Git show and then a commit ID, yeah. or let's try to take head. and it will default to, to head. Right, but let's just do this one, and then I guess that'll show me just what that looks like. But then if I get do git show, it I guess will show me what, what the last one is. Great. Other things, John. Uh, git log a dog sometimes it's helpful and if you don't have git k so git log and then there's a mnemonic so dash dash all dash dash um, decorate dash dash one line and dash dash graph I find this pretty helpful to you don't have any merges so but this, this will show um, yeah sure so let me get into another thing of that, this should, this, this should do it, and then we can see. Yeah. Okay, good. It's a nice little text format for, for That's great. So what's, what's the difference between what you did now and, and the same command of the other repo? Uh, um, there's no branch, it, there's branches on this one, so you can see that this uh, one has branched, okay. and on the other one it was just a straight line as far as the eye could see. There are probably branches here, but I, I, I can't see them in this particular Okay. There's also a git uh, checkout, and then I can't remember the exact name, but there's an add date, and then you can put a date, and then right. check out whatever the repository was at that without having to deal with, with the ID. Yeah, so there are other ways to reference this. There's a lot, there's so much in git, right? Like if I go git, then it gives me all of these commands, and these are the easy ones. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, we can spend the next hour talking about our favorite git commands if we'd like. However, I think Hubert wants to present. Yeah, Bob. Is there an easy way to, to compare the file that you currently have to a specific one in the repo? Is there a way to con uh, to look at a file that you have versus one in the repo? Yeah. So it will be one in the repo at a certain commit. Right. And yes, there is a way to do that. Um, there's a git diff that will allow them to do that. Don't ask me what it is offhand. Basically, at this point is the point when I start going to Stack Exchange. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, after you merge uh, terminology branch to yep. uh, master branch, yep. what happens to the terminology branch? Okay, so that's a good question. Once I merge terminology branch into the master branch, what happened to the terminology branch? The terminology branch is still there, right? Git branch dash A, it shows me this, right? There's master and terminology still. However, for cleanup purposes, <laughs> People will say, I don't want terminology anymore. So then they go git branch dash D terminology. Minus capital D. 
Hmm? I think I use Captain D for some reason. I don't know. This is what I've used. And then git branch dash d terminology, and then that gets rid of it. Right? Now, a branch in git is just a label, actually. So there's a bunch of stuff going on beneath the scenes, but conceptually we can think of it as now this branch is gone. The commits are actually still around, but the branch is gone. Okay? So the branch doesn't take up space, it's just part. Yeah. So you don't need to trim file space by the branch. Yeah. Git's really good about being cheap about branching and merging, and older version control is not There's a slight inaccuracy. Branches are essentially free if they've been merged, but if not, they can have stuff in them around and carried around. So cool. say you have a repository and some you create a branch and you add a huge file to that branch and you push it, that file will be there or maybe you'll get it when they download it because they'll have to get the whole state of the repository. But if you delete that branch now everything shrinks back up. So git branches can take up some space if they're not merged yet. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah, they can add some overhead. Let's stop. I want Hubert to have lots of time because Matrix is the thing you all came to here to see. So let's take a break, maybe a five minute break, and then we'll come back. <laughs>